Uh, our commentator uh, hardly needs an introduction. Most of us know him, Jim Collins. Uh, you know, he teaches at, uh, at Georgetown. And th thankfully, he gave me a truncated version of his CV, which would take me, I don't know how long, to, uh, to read. We all know Jim from his uh, first monograph, The Fiscal Limits of Absolutism. Uh, and then books continued at a regular pace for the rest of his uh, career. Uh, uh, from tribe to nation, and of course the magisterial uh, state uh, in, of, of France, uh, which he published for the uh, the state in early modern France, which he published for the first time in 1995, and then was called upon to come out with a second edition, which was what 40 percent expanded. Yeah. So that's like writing a yeah, that's like writing a, a whole other book. He has uh, a, a number, of, a couple of books uh, in press: Republic, uh, Republicanism and the State in Early Modern France, coming forthcoming with Cambridge, and Absolutisme et Immobilisme des Mythes à la Royalité. Are either of these your Collège de France lectures brought into a published form? Those were published as uh, what was it called? The, the, the uh, La monarchie républicaine, la monarchie, la yeah. monarchie, yeah. monarchie absolue. So a whole slew of publications uh, and more, more coming. So, uh, Jim, see what you got to say about these, all right, all those papers. Well, I'll go quickly so we have a little bit of time to, uh, um, watch them call it. I'll discuss the films and everybody wants to talk about their favorite movies. So I'll, I'll do that. Um, I was going to show a couple of clips, but I'm not quite sure I could do this easily here. Um, I've been involved in teaching films since 1983 when I was at Lafayette College. I first taught a class on collaboration and resistance in World War II through film. Um, I don't want to say that was a different universe, but I had to learn how to become a film projectionist. And the guy who taught me began as a film projectionist of silent movies. He was then retired, and he used to tell me stories about what it was like to project films circa 1920. Uh, so that was my introduction. Now everybody just goes on canvas and watches on their own. Bourbon France has given us more films, TV shows, and even cartoons than we can count. The themes continue into the revolution when the stories built around aristocratic heroes men roughly equivalent to the liberal nobles of 1789, have long been popular. Novels like The Scarlet Pimpernel by the Baroness Emma Orci, a Hungarian noblewoman whose family fled their estates in the late 1860s, fearful of those revolutionary times, became common themes for the movies. Her Sir Percy Blakeney, an English daredevil, long a hero on the London stage, because it was originally a play, became familiar to American audiences through the 1934 movie, The Scarlet Pimpernel, where he was played by Leslie Howard. Sixteen years later, Daffy Duck would take up the role of the Scarlet Pimp Pumpernickel in one of Warner Brothers' greatest cartoons. And I was going to show you a little clip of that. I don't know if we could figure out how somehow to get that. Um, our papers remind us that kings from Louis XIII to Louis XVI took it on the chin. In the case of Robert Morley's <laughs> Louis XVI in the 1938 classic Marie Antoinette on the double chin. <laughs> uh, Louis <laughs> Morley's Louis is a rotund doofus whom the <laughs> lovely Laura Monsieur desperately tries to please. His childlike glee about hunting and fixing clocks, we've already seen him fixing clocks, all 20 of which strike the hour at the same time, or almost a lot, he tells her on their first night together, stands in tar stark contrast to the evil sophistication of his cousin Philippe d'Orléans. Norman naturally falls for Tyrone Power on loan from Fox. He was then their biggest box office star to MGM. Power was later considered for the role of Ashley Wilkes, who of course made famous by our friend the Pimpernel. Orleans gets the typical Hollywood treatment of villains in the 1930s, complete with overtones of bisexuality. And I was immediately reminded of Nicole's comment, so it's troubling, about a contemporary television show doing exactly the same thing. And you can see a lot of Hollywood films in the 30s and 40s, you almost always know who the villain is because of his sort of uh, slightly off male sexuality, right? It's a sure sign who it's going to be. Those of you who've ever seen Laura, I uh, can think about that film as a classic example. All right. Um, and so, I'll jump ahead through that. Um, I was really struck also by Greg's comment about the uh, Guardian discussing new wave of progressive costume dramas. Uh, writing period film has gained considerable currency as an illuminator of contemporary social issues. Historians 
obviously have pointed that out, but um, recent films, and I, I, some of my graduate students who are here, um, and I went to see a preview of Mary, Queen of Scots, actually. The distributors gave us free tickets and free beer, so why not? Um, and it actually was surprisingly historically accurate, most of it. I mean, there were a few things that were twisted around, but they had obviously gone to great lengths to recreate a lot of the characters in a relatively uh, accurate way, which was quite striking. We might think of the contrast here between how, how these things are about their own times, the contrast precisely between the 1938 Marie Antoinette, which was made during the Hayes Code, um, where sexuality can't be direct, uh, addressed directly at all, and the Sofia Coppola version, where obviously she could openly portray Marie Antoinette's sexuality. Her version owed much to some modern scholarship, I think, on topics like Marie Antoinette's wardrobe, Yes, we get the infamous shopping scenes, but we also see Marie Antoinette in simpler clothes, and I was very much struck in watching and thinking about Caroline Weber's Queen of Fashion. Um, we might consider Charlotte's Louis XIII, the inevitable foil for Richelieu. Cardinal made an ideal villain, particularly in an Anglo-American culture that remained so profoundly anti-Catholic in the 1930s. She mentions Adolphe Monjou in the role of Louis in the Douglas Fairbank silent classic. I love that irony because I recall the reaction of my then mother-in-law, who was an immigrant from France, to the 1973 Michael York version. She was appalled that someone the size of Charlton Heston played Richelieu. In her eyes, only one American actor was fit to play the role, Adolphe Monchou. So here we have this French woman who thinks that he was the perfect Richelieu. Right. The, that always reminds me, of everything, you know, it reminds me of the rejection letter I got from uh, Stanford University Press in 1984 from my first book, uh, which told me to take up drink, among other things, mm -hmm. uh, that no one would ever publish anything on 17th century France, uh, unless I could prove that Louis XIII and the Duke of Buckingham were secretly having homosexual trysts in a castle somewhere on the English Channel. Um, actually, I still have that letter. It's great. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, there you go, right? <laughs> As Charlotte puts it, the true problem with these versions of Louis XIII from La Rochefoucauld to Dumas, from Dumas to BBC One, is all of them serve a purpose aside from portraying the real king. And Greg points out the relationship of long-established image of the absolute king, the humbled nobility, rather than the real Louis XIV. Um, and Nicole, in that same theme, I think, Nicolas de Floch is an enjoyable murder mystery with high production values, beautiful costumes, and engaging storylines. Well, there's a lot of truth to all of that, and I think that what's happening in these films is that they do reproduce these old stereotypes. And I'm always struck by the fact that this is true not only in a popular culture, but in something like the AP history exam. Back in the 1980s, I was on one of the panels that helped create the AP history exam at that time. And the other two panelists, because each person brings in 20 questions, and the other two panelists had brought in, you know, who said l'état c'est moi. And I said, well, you know, we pretty much know that he didn't actually say that. The story doesn't appear until the 1830s, almost certainly a made-up story. And Fritz Hartung uh, explained this in an article published in 1946. So they took it out of the exam. It's now back in the exam, right? And it's in most textbooks as well. It had disappeared for a while and has come back again. And the interesting question for us as historians is why do these certain stereotypes come back again and again, right? And I, I would point to, to three of them. One is that absolutism requires a narrative of Louis XIII and Richelieu, of Louis XIV, of Louis XV and the deluge, and the poor Louis XVI, who's almost always portrayed in a slightly positive way, that he's a good feeling king, he means to do well. And almost all the films that portray him, portray him in that way. Uh, you might think of Renoir's La Marseillaise. Right, where the queen is obviously evil, but Louis is good feeling, but then he wants to eat his tomatoes, so you know, what are you going to do? Um, we also have this good noble, bad noble business where there's the bad, evil aristocracy, but at the same time there were these good nobles who were trying to save things. Um, and that's a very prominent image, I think, in American films. And the last one, exactly, I think, what Nicole pointed out, masculinity and sexuality and gender roles. This is stereotypes that get repeated in these films again and again. A, a certain type of masculinity is, quote unquote, the right type of masculinity. And any male who doesn't belong to that is obviously going to be a villain in the thing at some point or another, right? And the, the flip side of this, I, I would have to say, that is that there's more positive to these films than I think we're letting on. 
And the reason I say that is I now teach a course at Georgetown. We have a two semester gen ed requirement in history and one of the semesters is a highly focused course in my course on Louis XIV in Versailles. And in the fall, I would say about 15 or 20 percent of the students told me that they took that class because they'd seen the Netflix show. And virtually every one of them said to me, I wanted to find out what the real story was, right? And you think about this and you think, yeah, you know, we look down on stuff like this or on popularizers. And those of some of you may be familiar with the work of Linda Kelly, um, for Women in the French Revolution, popularizing history. I have her grandson in class. Um, and it turns out they're close family friends of Antonia Fraser, and the two of them are always fighting who's going to sell more books. But he came to my class precisely because his grandmother had written these sort of general history books, and he wanted to find out more. And I think we underestimate the role that this kind of stuff plays in actually generating interest in history, even though if they begin from the wrong place. And I'll put in, as a final comment, a, 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 uh, a plug for my favorite Three Musketeers movie, which is the 1953 French version. And the hero of the movie is D'Artagnan's valet, Planchet. Uh, the, the musketeers are all idiots. And the, the, the great comic actor, André Bourville, plays Planchet. And he solves all the problems. And D'Artagnan and the others had absolutely nothing to do with it. That's the one to watch. Thanks. And raise your hand, and I'll call on them. And then whoever it's directed to will answer. Amita. kings to queens, just as a kind of observation. I teach a seminar on Marie Antoinette, um, and I stopped using um, the Sofia Coppola movie, which was two hours of, of my life that I will never get back. <laughs> um, and, um, and partly because the students were so attached to it. But So now I use uh, Les Adieux à la Reine, Farewell to My Queen. And my students actually made a very smart observation. They, they noted that in American renditions of Marie Antoinette, she's forever stuck as an adolescent. Whereas the French versions, she is an adult. And, you know, and Diane Kruger's portrayal is actually really ambiguous in a very in a positive way and I think that's something else too that I think gets embedded in these narratives of kings and queens is how we feel about age and even celebrity um, c com comes into it as well so it's it uh, so I, th I think in addition to sexuality that that there are all these other elements that get in enmeshed with it and just so you know there is a novel called Marie Antoinette serial killer anybody <laughs> 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 else I think it's important, I'm Bob Blackman at Hampton Sydney College, I think it's important for us to recognize the brilliance of Mel Brooks' portrayal of Louis XVI, because he really does get at all the cliches, not just about Louis XVI, but also Louis XV and Louis XIV in his portrayal, and really hammers the notion of monarchy as the problem that caused the French Revolution, and thus is catering to the, the American public in multiple ways. It's a great follow-up to Blazing Saddles, if anyone ever wants to put that course together. <laughs> uh, Brian Sandberg, Northern Illinois. Um, one of the things I found interesting cutting across the presentations was that you were bringing out elements of the sourcing the sourcing of the film images. And, and so much of uh, certainly Hollywood, but other film uh, traditions uh, approaches to historical film is often on the look over the stories. And yet on both the stories, looking back at different levels of literature, I mean, memoirs, you know, uh, post Louis XIV were mentioned. Um, you know, literature, including Dumas, but others from the 19th century mentioned. But we can also throw in, you know, paintings from the 17th century, from the 18th century, from the 19th century, pre-Raphaelites and these sorts of things, as well as early films, later films. These all become, I think, references for any modern film that comes out. And, you know, I think if we think about collectively how we can analyze uh, the sourcing 
of film productions, the way we look at the sort of historiographical uh, production of historical writing, we might get further in figuring out how these images are actually then communicated to our students and, and where they're coming from. I should say, in response to that, that the Versailles TV series had a series of shows attached to it, the real Versailles, meaning that it, it, mm -hmm. it had pretensions to being historical. Um, they played a historical consultant. Well, sort of. Yeah. Mm. Well, it was Matthew de Vinat who wrote yeah. the yeah. biography of the uh, um, the uh, Valet de Chambre, yeah. which yeah. means that the Valet de Chambre has a huge role yeah. in the series. Um, <laughs> but the the shows all uh, concentrate on the externals. Um, how is the show realistic? The sets, the costumes, almost nothing about whether the relationships or the things that happened had anything to do. It was all based on the realism of the externals, of, this, of the look of the show. Oh, yeah. 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 It's interesting how you get, I mean, like the two Marie Antoinette films are both to some degree built on books. I mean, the 1938 Van Dyke one is based on stuff on Zweig, who's also from Austria, interestingly enough. Um, and the Fraser book had a big influence on the Coppola version. So there are often times we can often trace these things to very specific texts. Nicole, do you know what the source of uh, the Le Floch series is? Well, it's based on a set of on, novels. On novels. Yes. So the, but is there a historical consultant behind some of this? Any historians get involved in it? Probably just the novelist. No, I think, this I, thing? I think the novelist, Poirot, did his own okay. research. Like uh, many, it's like a series with the hero, kind of like the Captain Elatriste novels. I don't know if you know about this. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a series, several, several uh, novels where each has a case. Mm -hmm. And he clearly, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's a novelist himself. He clearly did a lot of his own research and is really interested in court politics. Right. Five or six of them have been translated into English. Yes, you're right. Yeah, some of them have been translated. But not all. Back there. Is this actually on? <laughs> you have to speak up there, Jay. <laughs> now that's recorded. Got it. Um, well, th th this is a doubly indulgent, self-indulgent question because I'm going to ask my own former student a question, and it's, it concerns the beast of the Chevaux d'Or. Um, because I was really struck in that uh, the, the scene where, where the, the villain is whipped, is being whipped. That whole scene, I was struck by the imagery that is carried over from Le Pac de Lou, because you, you've got uh, mysteries unfolding in brothels. You've got the claw, the claw from Le Pac de Lou, the use of the whip, uh, and the ambiguous sexuality of the villain. It's, I, I was just going to ask whether you think that this is a sign of the influence that that blockbuster film had on you know, the, the French cinematic vocabulary. Yeah, I think, I think it's totally possible because the film was what, in the 2000s? 2000, I think. 2000, yeah. right? And this show goes from 2008 to 2015. So yeah, I think there, there is some popularity of those themes, the sinister and also racy and uh, mysterious. There is even an episode where they do go down to the Perigord, I think, and um, deal with some sort of entity that's been killing peasants. And it's very, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very similar. And I wanted to include it, but I, I got pressed for time. But basically, it turns out that it's a very uh, dissolute, aristocratic couple where um, the nobleman had a hunting accident and he is unable to engage in sexual activity and so his wife is it's it's really messed up but his wife is basically um seducing many of the local peasants and engaging in all sorts of hanky panky and the husband uh is really interested in what she's doing because he can't do anything himself and then afterwards they kill off the peasants and get rid of their bodies and it's this mysterious and everyone thinks it's an evil beast but nicolas le Floc has to go and investigate and uh, it turns out it's a horrible, uh, corrupt aristocracy in the South. Of course it's. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's always but, a horrible. But yeah, I think you're totally right. I think there is influence. Time for one more. 
Thank you. Um, I, I, I was way out of my field. I mean, not sort of. Um, so, uh, last uh, sort of a wrap up to the panel. Is there any consistent place that the French old regime, French Revolution, occupies in the mind of people who actually seek to sell books in the American, the North American context? In other words, does is there? Or is it just a whole panoply of things that can be said? There's no way to even categorize what what works or what they think works, what they how they because they're choosing they're choosing something alien. I mean, it's not their it's not the American North American culture. They're choosing to deal with the subject. Well, is there a play? Is there is there a, is there a trajectory? Is there some way to think about this? You know, I'm getting my I'm I want to walk out of here with something to say that is coherent, uh, as opposed to fun, interesting, insightful. Just some. Is there is there anyone to take a stab at that, or is that just too hard? But could you reframe the question really quickly? Yeah, the question is the question is when when a mass media operation decides to. Do tell a story about the old regime and the French Revolution. Is is it evocative of anything at all consistent that they're rather than just use the United States or, or or Canada or Istanbul or you know whatever? I mean, is there is, do you detect that there's some you know montalité about about this era that uh, evokes stuff and they don't have to explain it? That's Oh, okay. Anything consistent, or is it just every film sui generis? Well, with, with Versailles, it's opulence, and it's it's one of France's number one tourist attractions. I think they're assuming that a lot of people have been to France have been to Versailles, mm -hmm. so they're just using that they as the that. focus. Like Versailles set. is the focus, even though the interior shots are shot at Vaux le Vicomte. Um, the exterior shots were actually shot at Versailles. They got permission, which is unusual. Um, it's one of my favorite moments is the king and his mother looking down at Vaux le Comte at the end of The Man in the Iron Mask. Oh, yes. <laughs> but, yeah. Right, right. Push that further, then, the French Revolution is the thing that either improves or messes it up. Exactly. Right? It's one well, right. Jack, if you think also there's, rather than some sort of coherent narrative, the specific images, like you're just saying, Versailles being one of them, one of my favorite examples is another cartoon. Uh, Tom and Jerry cartoon, The King's Mousquetaire, right? <laughs> and Tom is supposed to protect the banquet from the mice. And the g commander of the guard says to him, you know, this is set, of course, in Three Musketeer Land. If you don't protect the food, then you're going to suffer the consequences. And they pan to the outside, and what's outside, what are the consequences? A guillotine. Right? <laughs> All right, so I mean, that tells you that there are these certain stock images. The fact that that's, you know, yeah, utterly ridiculous, that doesn't, they don't have to explain anything. And I think there are certain images, and I think you're exactly right. Versailles is one of those. And then you don't have to say anymore. There's the yeah. image. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, Go yeah, question. Mita? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the pleasure of that opulence to, uh, as, as a, viewer and at the same time there's a kind of guilt that's attached to that pleasure and you can displace the pleasure onto the decadent aristocracy hmm. yeah yes. decadence is decadence. what i would yeah. go with decadent yeah. and yeah. depraved so it becomes this area of fantasy where you can have the fantasy but then you can kind of distance yourself from it because they're the, the, it's the aristocracy which is the other, yeah. ironically, yeah. even though they're the insider. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, you get a great sense of this. One of the first big American films about this kind of stuff, D.W. Griffith's Orphans of the Storm, yes. made in 1920 or 21. Yes. And the decade is exactly what you're talking about. And then it's made, it's an anti-Bolshevik film. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Robespierre is the Bolshevik, and mm -hmm. Danton is the hero, rides in on a white horse to save the day at the end. Literally, rides in on a mm -hmm. white horse. Um, and the hero is, of course, a good aristocrat. Right. Right? Uh, so a weird critique of capitalism w without being a critique of capitalism, too. Yeah. Yes, and in, and in Versailles, the, obviously, Louis XIV, Louis XIV plays the revolution. He is taming a decadent and obnoxious aristocracy. <laughs> it's the most bizarre thing you can imagine, right? To make the most supposedly absolute king in history the agency for undoing the great villains of the piece who are obviously nasty aristocrats. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, well thanks so much. This is this is fun.